Hello, welcome to our Facebook Live event. I'm Gundula and this is Ernst. And we are very happy to be here. It's full spring around us. It's a beautiful time of year. Our gardens are looking divine. And um, we've got a nice chunk of time that we would like to discuss all the exciting things happening here. A um, lot happening this week. And we also want to take your questions. So please, if you can leave a comment on the Facebook Live comment section. Um, near the end of the session, we'd really like to engage with you and answer all your garden-related questions. Um, just to give you an idea of what we'd like to discuss now is where we are, who we are, and the special garden flowering events that's happening at the moment. Because we'd love to invite you to come and visit. Um, it's a busy time of year. But we've got new developments and collections we're working on. It's, it's really just to share the joy. So um, I've been gardening here now for more than 10 years. It's been incredible. I'm the first gardener to arrive here and really just see it growing from ground roots and extending. Um, my main job at the moment, because it shifts so much, is to take care of the healing garden where I find the plants that make these wonderful concoctions um, and share health with people. And I also work in the flower room where I'm actually mostly making these wonderful flower bouquets and celebrations of the season that we can share online so people can buy things in the Western Province or Cape Town region to actually enjoy in their homes. It's about bringing Babylon still into your home, which has been quite a new development here. Um, Adams here has got his own story. <laughs> yeah, Gundula, I'm a horticulturist and botanist, and uh, I worked at Kirschmas for 41 years, but I'm so thankful for the last six years to work full-time here. And the first time I met you, you invited me, That's right. was about 15 years ago at the beginning of this garden. Yeah. And it looked completely different, almost like a desert. Exactly, it was, just it was just barren. Barren, barren, barren. The wind and blowing dust. Exactly. <laughs> it, it, and it was, yeah, it was also, a, I think it was also a light spring in the dry time of yeah. the year as well. Yeah. But so we're sitting here in the Clever House, and behind us is a hill, and that's called yeah. the Babylon's Turin, or the Tower of Babel, or the, yeah, it's the, what the farm is, is known or, or named for. Yeah. And actually, all the vegetation that we, we see on that copy and around us are Boulan granite feinbos. So it's a type of feinbos, mm. but where the, the main uh, uh, plant on, in this area is rhinosterbos. Mm. So we can also call it rhinosterfeld. Mm. So it's summer dry with, with, long, yeah, with short, moist winters, but long, dry summers. Mm. But most of the crops we grow here, uh, obviously, are from summer rainfall areas. So to compensate, we are allowed to pump water from the Berg River and into our various reservoirs. We, we've got lots of reservoirs full of fish and other mm. animals as well. And that's how we sustain all our different and various plants. So my function at Babylon's Touring is I work mainly with the succulent plants. Mm. It, I, was, uh, I specialize with succulents at uh, uh, Kirstenbosch. Yeah, I, I specialize with succulents again. The house, very much the same as this, just adjacent to it, is a succulent house. So I filled it up with succ succulents from all over South Africa, great diversity, planted to each within their families. Mm -hmm. And we are all cared for. I've got to play mother, father, and doctor to them. So when a plant is a little bit sick or unhappy, I've got to give them water. And the, the bigger the collection, the more difficult it becomes. But apart from the succulents, I also look at other indigenous plants. For instance, we've got a big neo shade garden in development. We've also got a big cycad garden. And what is also uh, today very exciting is that we've acquired two huge encephalitis uh, uh, mm. woody, or wood cycad. It's a cycad that already went extinct in nature. So for people who don't know cycads, they are cone bearers and they relics of the past. So many of them are on the brink of extinction. Mm. It, just, it just shows at the time Cycads used to be the dominant with other cone bearer plants, and today only 0.5% of the world flora are cycads. Who's to blame for the extinction? It's not us humans, but it's the flowering plants. They're far more successful and, and marching along and, and, and so competitive that they've uh, marginalized many of these uh, cone bearing plants. So these two woodies are, they went extinct at Ngoya Forest, a granite dome near Mtunzini. Okay. And, uh, and Medley Wood discovered them yeah. at two plants in his own private garden. And then uh, Alan Huntley at the time, about 1992, transplanted these two plants 
into Mr. Thorpe's garden in Durban. And they were already, by the time, at the time, they were already big, they had to use huge cranes to do it. And when these plants became available for sale, the owners bought them, and uh, uh, one of our colleagues, Hendrik, boxed them. They went to great care, and also, again, had to lift them up. By this time, the Seigert is already three to 4.5 meters tall. Yeah. So the first thing that we had to do is remove all the leaves of the Seigert. So that was done. And, and in, in head of the operation were Lawrence, who looked after Lawrence Ailes, yeah. who looked after that, and uh, uh, they were transported onto huge trucks. And the two Seigerts together with their steel frames weighed 22 tons. Yeah. And they arrived last Friday and they were right. had to be uh, removed to an, another uh, low bed vehicle and they brought them and a special amphitheater were created for them. And these, these two plants have just been planted over the last uh, weekend. I saw them arriving because it looked like these rhinoceros is being traveling. It's, it's yeah. incredible to the extent they yes. did and they boxed the, the, especially the roots. Because, you exactly. know, young Keep plants intact. transplant very easy, but as you become older and older, it becomes transplanting becomes more difficult mm -hmm. and we're just praying that this I'll explain to you a little bit later but it's got various arms and each arm mm -hmm. uh, I use different types of geology so rocks are very very important to us as well at Babylon Stewart and Farm yeah. and the education of uh, rocks because we eat from the soil yes. and where does soil come from the rock yeah. and, the, and the soil type is determined by the rocks and rocks weather and it's usually the lichens that eats away and, the, and leaving those beautiful sculptures so mm -hmm. the, the rocks are there both to, for educational purposes, but also the art of the rocks, also to emphasize that. Yes. So we've got most of the main geological formations from this region. And we will have all the, we also, we even brought in living fossils. In other words, we brought in fossil trees from Sienico, uh -huh. where, where some of the farmers uh, uh, yeah. opened their hearts and gave it to us. And we will, we want to display the living fossil with the real fossil. But what, what makes Velvicia such an interesting plant, I brought the, the plant Mm. A, a young plant as well, or a, a dead plant, mm. just to show you. Mm. It's in Afrikaans, it's known as an afkoboom. So the, the plant starts as a normal little seedling plant with first the two seedling leaves and it, yes. then it gets its two permanent leaves. And then the plant decapitates itself. In other words, that's a decapitation. And the only growth then that will take ah. place are the two leaves. Yes. And it's the only true evergreen plant because the leaves come out like a conveyor belt and they will just grow. 15 centimeters about every year. Yeah. And, and, and the plant can grow up to 1,500 years. And if you multiply 15 centimeters by that amount of years, it's the plant with the longest leaves in the world. But you never see them in the Namib desert. If you see well, which has also yes. got short leaves. Yeah. And the reason is of the hot sun, yeah. they just weather away. And, yeah. and, and you just see the beautiful undulation. But apart from that, the plants, you've got males and female plants. So the plants are is such a simple life form. So it's back to basics, a minimalist plant. So uh, it's, it's a plant which doesn't uh, carry any baggage. Most plants carry baggage in the sense of they've got mm. twigs to, to and yeah. leaves to displace. Yeah. Belvicia never has to displace the leaves because they just keep on coming out. And then they can put all their focus on only reproduction. Right. And so it's got male plants and female plants. Male plants usually... I've sown them from seed, uh, usually about three years after sowing, you can get them into cone. Female plants a little bit later because the cost of production of these female cones is much later. So, uh, uh, and uh, it's in, in, uh, in the desert area, they, they're pollinated by tiny little flies. And the flies will fly from bush to bush when they, when they come. And there's also a little bit sugar reward for the little insects. Nice. Uh, so that's the story of the Velvicia plant. And because for, and the interesting thing is as well, they discovered fossils of Helvetias, but not in the, in the Namib Desert or in, in Africa, as you would think, yeah. but in northern Brasilia. And looking remarkably the same, I think they found two or three species, which shows that the Velvicia plants, this, this order they belong to, the Gnetales, was once very widespread all over the world yeah. during the time when the conifers reigned with the dinosaurs. But then the, with climate change, these plants only managed to survive in the Namib Desert. And the reason, as we believe, is because of the fog that comes in from the desert. Of course, they naturally had big, quite broad leaves. Mm -hmm. The fog condensates on the leaves and nourishes the plants. But when, we, when I sow the seeds, I usually notice the first thing that comes is a, it's a thin root that goes very, very deep to first yes. get the, the depth. Yes. 
to get moisture from below, yeah. but they've also got shallow roots, and the shallow roots are there to pick up the, the dew plants. And they provide habitat for so many animals. Underneath the undulating roots, you get, for instance, the Namakoko chameleon, Chameleon namaquensis, mm -hmm. and the desert adders and, and lizards and many, many other insects, and also bugs. There's various bugs that take. And also they provide food in, in very, during very dry parts of the year. Mm -hmm. Usually the, the animals will go to other things to eat, which are more palatable. But when it becomes so dry, they'll start eating the leaves of Elvitia, and they will quickly recover again uh, uh, in a season or two. Mm -hmm. But that's, that's the, the, the story of Velvicia. And mm -hmm. then, Gundula, mm -hmm. if you stand on the Velvicia garden, and, and the Velvicia garden is also for other number plants, if you look to the west, there is a new garden. And, and yeah. please tell us about this, yeah. this mustain that that's is just right. known. Yeah. <laughs> so mustain is an interesting um, name for a, a place. It's a Dutch word meaning kitchen garden. So a very simple, an extension of our vegetable garden we've taken to the back there. Um, our restaurant has a big demand <laughs> and so we've luckily been able to extend in that um, area. So it's mostly, uh, well I had a look, picked some beetroot there this morning, some fennel, some herbs in between because we always need to have enough biodiversity. And starting any new space because also it wasn't the best piece of land that was given to us, we've had to rejuvenate the land. So. I think what's very interesting is for me to see how you bring in the wild concept and your rocks that you use to foundation your site and then slowly inviting all the animals to come in. I do the same with this area. So yesterday they were actually cutting down the green manure that we've been planting. So it was a mix of lupins and grains, um, flowers even in between. And then within a week or two, they'll start plowing it into the soil. So. We have to wake up the soil to allow for the fertility of the soil, to allow for whatever we're going to grow on top. And exactly, if, you can, if I can interrupt you shortly. Yeah. I always talk about the five million, of the, big, of the big five, but it's the big five million that lives in the soil, and that's what you are exactly. trying to tell us. The better, yes. the, 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 the better the diversity of these microbes in the soil, the better we will eat, the better the, you know, the more healthy your vegetables yes. will be. Yes, so that's where we've started, really just taking almost mm. a year to ensure that the soil is going to be able to carry anything. Um, and now slowly what we'll do is start with some kind of crop rotation. Um, the veggies are quick, they'll just be going in and out. We also have a surrounding of quite a few herbs that again is for diversity but also to help us with whatever flavorings we need or healing that we need to do. Um, and then you've noticed also the climbers around the outside. So we've got grenadillas starting to climb up. Um, and fantastic underneath is the prenia, the Vatsiepampuinki. This rough. Yeah, so this is this very lush, green, succulent leaf. And it's fabulous to know that indigenous mm. plant we can actually now use almost as a main crop for our vegetables. Um, yeah, and, exciting and, yeah. because I, I really want people to actually go out there. We've got a gate just mm. as you go towards the Velvetia garden where you'll see the rockery. Mm. Um, there's a lovely little gate where you can go through walk up towards the dam in the center. It's a, a vast space, so what about three rugby fields almost that you can really go and enjoy. And paths meandering out from there again and looping back into the garden. So please come have a look. Yeah. Um, before we go too far, also please, we welcome you to um, send us some questions because we'll be wanting to answer lots of questions when we're near the, the final part of the, the section here. Um, because yeah. Um, and yeah. I also just want to mention, isn't it amazing, Gudula, that gardening started first with crop gardening for survival, like yeah. vegetables, and, and med medicinal plants to keep our bodies healthy. Yes. And, the, and then it evolved later on when we were, our minds were free or our hands were more free yes. to do other things. And if you think of vegetables, you plant a vegetable now, in three months you, you, can, you reap the crop. Yeah. And vegetables are pioneer plants, they're actually weeds. So they are... Uh, uh, cultured yeah. and, and selected. Noble noble weeds. Yeah, they're noble <laughs> weeds. And, they, but we, we, and if we talk about weeds, they've got a great important role they play. So we see them as a nuisance, but they still, they still uh, 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 sequest uh, uh, yeah. carbon and give us oxygen. It's, and they, it's they generally tend to be like the, the scabs of the land exactly. to allow for new exactly. growth to come again. Exactly. Yeah. If you cut your arm, your finger yes. or something, you get a scab. And you're right. Exactly. And that in the healing place takes place underneath that scab. And that's yeah. what the vegetables 
are. Yeah. And, and even many of our weedy plants, like like Songes uh, Oleraceus, uh, what is yeah. the, the dandelion? Dandelion. Now, some That's of them are uh, edible, one. and many there's many more in Portulac. Yeah. Uh, you can eat them on your eggs in the morning. So there are many other edible weeds which we also can select if yes. sh where, should it be necessary. Yeah. But there's one African vegetable also I want to mention. Yeah. It's the, the uh, Most of them come from other parts. Like, for instance, you know, mm. the, the, the your tomatoes yeah. from South America. and But there's the, the, the African watermelon. It's just a tsama. Yeah. Or uh, 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 that has been selected and yeah. grown into a watermelon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no. So Africa did give some to the world as well. And if I think of water blooming as well, yes. and which is known as the Cape weed, but for us it's not a weed. It's it's, but and, yeah, it's so beautiful in a in a pond, but but so nice to have water blooming oh, It's fantastic. one of the best vegetables yeah. we have, and it's now in season. Full bloom, <laughs> yes. We've got these wonderful marshland areas and it's just covered with white blossoms and even just the scent of the Valtablomeke is divine. And you also mentioned asparagus. Yes. So, yeah. <laughs> so in the um, Mustang we have a lot of artichokes that we've been planting. We'll be harvesting from them next year and the asparagus, it's asparagus season at the moment so you just see these heads poking out. Um, so it's an interesting combination, also interesting to see how the demand of the restaurant has changed through the years and again having indigenous plants creeping in and people just being so much interested in a much broader variety of things. Um, yeah. So celebrating everything that we've been doing here, we are heading up to this Sunday when it's garden day and I've actually asked my colleague to make this lovely flower crown for you which is um, been gathered from plants actually within your succulent house. So let me Thank crown our Olympic gardener over here. There we go. <laughs> I've got my enough. little one here too. Thanks. So these flower crowns are really symbols for Garden Day itself. And um, yeah, because we've been working so hard. <laughs> and Garden Day really is a time where you can enjoy it with your friends and your family, where you really can get. Um, everybody together and have a cup of tea. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we, we need this. <laughs> exactly. So it's as simple as making a delightful tea like this. I'd love you to taste mm. and tell me what you think is in it. I love color, so I always love adding some kind of color. Shugundula, it's, it's not only very beautiful, yeah. it's translucent red, but yeah. I can smell some pelargoniums. Mm -hmm. And that's shoot. Exactly. So tell us what Let is in it. Let me help you with your crown here. Um, so it's mostly just rose pelargonium which I've harvested from our field yep. at the back there. And it is just that infused in hot mm. boiling water. For the color, we've got some hibiscus floating at the bottom here, which is, again, an African plant, the roselle. And it is that simple. Um, very calming. So lovely if one had a long, hard week and you just want to kind of relax <laughs> and <you>. enjoy it. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> yeah, and, and to think that uh, we're celebrating gardening and it's still the, the most popular hobby all over the world, people yeah. garden. You, you work in an office or you, and you just get tired on a weekend and you just relax in your garden. And they've discovered that when people work in the garden that you're far less prone to get depressions. Mm -hmm. And they also did research, someone in, in, in Holland, that working for your soil, and becoming, you're getting your fingers into the soil, there's a substance in the soil that calms, calms one we as people. Yeah. So, so there's far more to gardening than we think. Absolutely. And it's, it, it's so wonderful to, to, to take life and we start growing it and we just see this miracle in front of our eyes to grow a tree yeah. when you're young and you start seeing developing it or just even an annual plant that you plant this uh, in yeah. the autumn and by springtime you see this beautiful flowers like on the Velvichia garden at the moment. All the Namakwa annuals are flowering at the moment, so so come and have a look at this garden mm. as well. Mm. And we're also going to intro introduce all the, the different reptiles to it, but first we had to, to uh, establish all your plants that will bring on the, the, the little insects that provide foods for the, the uh, blue-headed agamas yeah. and the local uh, cordialis lizards that we want. So just, I think that's our idea about Garden Day, is that we've got this one day in the year that we can celebrate. Um, but there's so much that has run up towards that. And I, I think when I, obviously gardening is this wonderful cyclical nature we have, but when I look at how you start a garden and it really starts with the rocks and how it slowly develops, this, this long period that it takes, but that we pause along the way to have our celebration. 
Um, but I, actually, because you've got such wonderful animals there, I w I'd love you to tell the visitor or the, the viewers um, about just how your rocks interact with the plants that you eventually want to plant there. Because you're only sowing now Valvetsias in December, you said. That's right. But you've had many, many months in preparation for this garden. That's I think right. this, this, this time mm. that we're only a small part of. Exactly. It's a time scale. And one, with gardening, we have to be very patient. Rome wasn't built in a day. Yeah. And, and we often, if you think of Rolf Dern, he created that beautiful garden in Claremont. He planted small trees in about 1840. Mm. And today it's, it's one of the best botanical gardens, situated very close to Kirstenbosch, yeah. but worthwhile to go and see. Yeah. Exactly here as well. So we always use the, the, pattern, the same ecological pattern that you see in nature that happens. So, uh, mm. uh, for instance, on the rockery, I started first introducing the, 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 the I created the, the landscape by the soil, then the rocks came. And then we plant, create, planting all the pioneer plants, the annuals. And at the same time, we're starting then with the long-lived plants, pelargoniums, little bulbs from Namakwa land, mm. and all from the west coast, little euphorbias, and giving them chance to... And you really kind of tuck them in between the rocks. So the you rocks. can actually come here and you can play and on the rocks. Exactly. And, yeah. you, and, and, and the, you will see them just like in Namakwa land. So we try to imitate a little, a little showcase of, of Namakwa land and, and the west coast in general. But, but once that is established, then we can start introducing the your longer-lived euphorbias. We also introduce large quiver trees, which we got from the garden. Mm. A lady that her husband died, and she didn't like the, the quiver trees, and the, she donated it to us, so we planted them. I yeah. still pray that they will grow, because they, they lay, were out of the soil for quite a long time. Okay. But the aloes are very hardy. Yeah. And succulents are like this. They, they are incredible. I mean, we've got such a diversity of succulents in South Africa, and we must ask ourselves why. Because it's a semi-arid climate, so yes. that's why they are absolutely ideal for, for water-wise mm. uh, gardening. Mm. But coming back to that, that garden, so the next phase will be is now that the, the, the annuals are established and the, the insects are coming in, we will introduce the second parts. And also the trees, we've, we've just planted some uh, uh, the lantern bushes uh, named Mania capensis. Yeah. We'll bring in the... Uh, the, the Villagranat with its rigosum or bovatum, its beautiful yellow flowers. And so we'll bring in characteristic desert plants to, to present that almost a desert atmosphere yes. for the Velvichias. But it's all a big experiment, yeah. and uh, let's hope it will work. But I've got but a good feeling about exactly, it. Exactly, because you so told me that you've already seen all these little um, li reptiles coming in. Yeah, already the little geckos the, the, from the north are already moved over the road on, onto them. Yeah. And there's, there's already uh, uh, signs, and also the, the local Cape skink, uh, uh, yeah. the three striped skinks, yeah. large lizards. They usually also pioneer lizards, they also come in quick. Yeah. And then the, it will also lead then to other reptiles. But, and we've got, and while creating that garden, we also mm. found three uh, uh, little slug eating snakes. In Afrikaans, we call them a tobacco rolling. Okay. Completely harmless. They only eat slugs and snails. A very handy snake. And the female, only that uh, she give birth to live little uh, snakes. And if you have them in your garden, they especially love compost heaps in areas where it's moist, where you get snails and slugs. That's where we'll seek out. If you see these little brown snakes, mm. they are completely harmless. Mm. And when, they, when you confront them, often they, they roll up like a little tobacco roliki. And that's just a, a strategy to protect themselves. So they, the head they will, uh, will protect within the ball, yeah. like a ball python does exactly the same. Yeah. And when a bird tries to pick it or a hardy does sometimes eat them, but right. it makes it, it's very difficult to eat them when they're in a little round ball. Yeah. So it's a very, very clever trick of this. Yeah. So it shows all over with the succulents, they've got all these adaptive strategies. Yes. And if I think many of our plants from the Eastern Cape, the mm. Kundula, they mm. make the world's best garden plants mm. because the, uh, each of the, the field around us are governed or, or ruled by bigger forces, like Feinbos is fire. But in the Eastern Cape, it is uh, a disturbance by big animals, and they've become so co-adapted yeah. to animal disturbance, yeah. like Pelargonians, for That's why you can just break off a piece, yes. put it in, hen and chickens, you can just give your neighbor yeah. a speck boom, you can just pull, push in, that they co-adapted, that they, they, got, they take advantage of abuse and turn That's it right. into good use. Yeah. And, and, and in our gardens, and, and the thing is, in our gardens, we get disturbance all the time. It's cats and dogs. And, and well, we even prune. as humans, you know. And as, as humans, we <laughs> exactly. walk on it and we, we, we scratch it, and that's what they want. So, yeah. and where you, all, wherever you go all over the world, in, in California, 
Mediterranean, you see South African plants that are hardy, that, that's the mm. big, big time survivors. Mm. And for instance, the Stelitzia region, they are so hardy and good that Los Angeles declared it their national flower, but it's a South African plant, for instance. And what a beautiful, the crane flowers, and yeah. what a wonderful water wise plant it is. And just like the clevias around us, you, a clever yes. you can plant in Cape Town and don't give it any water, yeah. and it will still flower faithfully yeah. in, in, uh, during springtime. Yeah. Isn't it incredible? It by, is. by, so we, our, flower, our indigenous flower uh, uh, plants tell us that they mm. went through a lot of hardships, but the end products are so mm. beautiful architecture. Mm. And if you look at our desert plants and the little lithops, they mm. are exquisitely uh, mm. shaped by suffering. And, mm. and, and in the end product is this beautiful little succulent plant which mm. people admire. But unfortunately, there's the element also of, mm. of reaping the, the felt sometimes for exporting. And that, but that's a different... Yeah. That's a different thing, but we are here today to celebrate. And yes. that's what we are celebrating. Because and it's also it's, it's wonderful to hear stories because if you like to hear what Adam says, I mean, both of us, we use Candide often. Candide is a gardening app that's for free. Candide is supporting Garden Day too, which is wonderful. <laughs> um, and you post every day very, a, a few plants. That's it. So I think just the, the broadness of being able to use this gardening app and so much knowledge in it. I mean, it is international at the moment, but we still have these wonderful um, local knowledge coming through on it. And so that's a great platform to use also if you have any questions. But please feel free to send questions to us so we can answer them. Um, yeah. <laughs> so I'll have a look to see. I'm going to use my phone to see if any questions come in. Um, and then I'll be able to read from the phone and we can discuss them here. Um, I think I have a question about just how the Velvetia was able to adapt so well from where it was when, when the continents were together. And I think with us having this fear of climate change, you know, tr trying to be able to get um, some hope out of mm. this incredible ancient plant and how we can use that kind of idea to sustain us. Yeah, so Velvicia, as I said, uh, the family mm. in the broader sense were very widely spread. Mm. And uh, but I think the secret lies within the Namib Desert because there was a very, very slow progression from uh, uh, moist to dry. Okay. And these plants could adapt. So yeah. it was one of the very, very few. And that's why we know it's the oldest desert in the world. Oh. For instance, the Atacama Desert yeah. in, in, uh, in South America, yeah. It's a much younger desert, but it's also got very interesting plants. But if you look at the, in general, as the, uh, the Namib, mm. it has special specialities, both in the plant, also in the animal world. If you think of the palmato gecko, there's also these kings that dive into the sand, yeah. the, the Namakwa chameleon, for instance, and yeah. the little desert adders and the side widening adders of them. But many, many other, if you look at the, the, the desert summer, that, that uh, yes. uh, or the, not the summer, now these big, yeah, the, what this, uh, naras, the nara melon. Yeah. It's, it's a succulent plant that produces these beautiful melons, mm. which the Topnar people live off. Mm -hmm. And they've, uh, they've uh, developed a whole industry around it. And it occurs only on those sand dunes of the Namib Desert. So, so definitely show, we, we sit with something special. And the Namib Desert is not where we see presently, it starts just north of Cape Town. It's not, it's, and it goes right through ah. to south of Luanda. Of course, Because yeah. the desert, you can't, you can't say, oh no, it only starts from the Orange River, because we, it already, when you go to Saldana, it's already dry, you get many succulents. And many yeah. succulents plants you get from Saldana, you'll find already at, still at Port Nolos and north. Yeah. But it just becomes more drier and open as the climate. But the, it is sustained by that life-giving fog that comes in. And mm. without that fog and with climate mm. change, we are worried Mm. It was already in the Richtersfeld National Park. Mm. They are losing many plants. And, mm. the, and the reason is, is because the, the fog doesn't come in so regularly anymore. Mm. But let's hope it was just a nasty period, cyclic period yes. that come in. Because yeah. we have these cy cycles as well. Yeah. And let's hope it was only that period and not a permanent thing. Because right. we, it, will be a, uh, it will be disastrous if it happens. Yes. But it's, a, it's, it's not only a very rich desert, but it's got other interesting features as well. So it's dwarfism. Many of the desert plants especially from the south, are very small. They've got an active growing season in winter time. And being dwarf and close to the ground, they can pick up the sun, and the energy on the sun. And, and during the summer times, they just go into sleeping mode completely and yeah. in a rest mode yeah. for that long dry summers. And just like the annuals, 
yeah. they, they, they escape the droughts by being seed during that period and then yes. becoming alive again in the autumn time when they start germinating. Yeah, yeah that's right. But, but I'm just noticing all these clavias <laughs> around us. Yeah. And I see that they've got big open flowers. So the architecture of these flowers always tells you who are the pollinators. So the pollinators of the, of the clavias, these open flowers, is usually a large table mountain beauty butterfly. And I've seen them on top of Table Mountain as well. But all the other clevers got tubular flowers and hanging. And That's bird. Right. And so always when we look at the flower, you always see that adaptation. And so yes. beautiful uh, with these, these open flowers. I haven't yeah. seen any butterflies coming in yet, but... <laughs> I've seen <laughs> some birds seen some? before. Mm -hmm. Okay. Not only when I have enough mm -hmm. time to sit still in the garden. So, yeah, <laughs> but it's, it's good. And um, there's a question coming about flowers here, about velvetsias. How long does it take for a velvetsia to mature after planting it? Okay, the, the mm. experience that I have with, mm. is that because we give them bottom heat, I think in nature it's much longer. You can at least put maybe 10 years longer. But What do you mean with bottom heat? So what I mean with bottom heat, yeah. in Kirschmoss, in the, in the big conservatory, we introduced a, a heating cable. Okay. The same we've introduced for this velvet chair garden uh -huh. as well. And, we, and once we plant the seeds, we, we, uh, uh, we put the heat on and we, then we make use of a uh, another thing, a fungal inoculant. Mm -hmm. Instead of using fungi, because these, these seeds, you must remember, they come from a desert part, yeah. suddenly put into a moist area, there's a lot of fungi spores. They're not adapted to withstand these foreign fungi yes. and they quickly succumb. But if you use a, fungal in, a good fungal inoculant, like Tricure uh, uh, or Trichoderma, yeah. that the, the fungi spores germinate with a little seedling latches on with the roots mm. and it causes extensive root system and it also chases away or forms a competition to all the bad fungi. Mm. But uh, the, so my experience is you sow the seed, the seed will germinate within from three days to about three weeks. So they are quickly, when the, when the temperature are right in midsummer, yes. they germinate like anything. It's a summer okay. rainfall yeah, plant. Yeah, they have to take a chance. So they, they germinate. And then the first thing the seedling does, they develop a long taproot. So this is a Velvetia plant and that's the taproot. Yeah. And this taproot will, will go down very, very deep. But I find the, the, the quickest that the one has matured and produced a milk cone was 18 months. But that's quite unusual. Mm -hmm. But usually it's about uh, three years. Okay. But that's under cultivation and under ideal conditions. Okay. Males can afford to do it. But female plant to mature is yeah. usually after about five years and longer. But usually it is... The, the Velvicia at, at Kirschmoss are now coning quite regularly, but that's what we found in the beginning as well. So we've mm. used the same red sand that I've used there mm. in, our, in our Velvicia garden here as well, but yeah. we'll watch it very carefully and we'll also uh, uh, post about it and how, how it is developing okay. and, and if it was a success and, yeah. and of them uh, growing. And, but luckily, Velvicia plant is, is, a, is quite common in the desert still, so it's not at all, it's not an endangered plant. Yes. But it can become, if, for instance, yeah. if, the, uh, if that fog cloud stops coming and the temperature changes and it becomes too hot, yeah. there is a point that is a, a, a yeah, it's a break off point. That, but yes. let's let's hope it will not happen. Yeah. And uh, so, well, which is, so I would say between three and five years in cultivation, ideal yeah. conditions. Yeah. But then about, I think in nature it will be at least uh, uh, 12 to 18 years if I mm. can extrapolate, because. Obviously, we, we're spoiling the plants. I play sure. father and mother to them, and yeah, I just, yeah, yeah. Yes, <laughs> I, I just yes. doze them. And they they've even have plants at, 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 in botanical gardens, for instance, like Baron Dahlem, which I grow in, uh, among peat. And they give them lots of water. Every week they water them. And the plants are very healthy. But I can understand the peat are very acidic, and the acidic, the acids chase away the bad fungi. Okay. So, so they don't like the oh, acidity. I yeah, yeah. And I think that's maybe the reason why they, yeah. they use the... the <laughs> It is strange, yeah. Okay, we have a question. Do we have a special tour where guests can see the new Velvetia garden in Mustaine? Well, we give lots of tours, but we don't have any tour yet. Or do you take but people no, when I you do. go on your special Gondula, tour? Yeah? So it, it, mm -hmm. it, uh, every uh, Monday and Friday, yeah. I do a tour, 11.30, a specialist tour. Yes. I especially take the people to show the cycads, mm -hmm. all the new developments, and one of them is then the, uh, uh, well, the new Elvichia Namab Garden, yeah. as well as then the, the Mustang. And depending on the people, uh, and also showing them the, uh, uh, the Spice House, 
yeah. and, and, and other aspects of, of uh, yeah. Babylon's tour, which is unique. So I know we have these um, 1130 tours that is free for anybody to come. We just want people to book for it. And we do different collections every day. And that those areas will be included in Alan's tours. I also know with our farm walk in the morning, with our hotel visitors, we, we like to go through exactly. those areas too. Because most people focus on the main garden and we just have such extensions beyond that which we'd like to show. Um, let's have a look here. How often do we water clivias when it's growing in a pot? <laughs> sure. Yeah, and, and, a, and a case like that is you, you can't make a rule. Yeah. It, it's, it's, it's the, uh, you, you can look at the condition of the plant and mm -hmm. you can look at when it's dry or not. But when you see it's a little bit dried, I would, I would say for as a rule of thumb, in the summer rainfall, in the winter rainfall area during summer, I would say once a week is, is efficiently. If you water it well, it would, yeah. because the, the, the roots are quite thick and fleshy, they retain a lot of water. Yeah. The, leaves, le the leaves are leathery, so they can take a lot of uh, 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 a drought. Mm. But even if you, if you water them less, they will still thrive. Mm. But they will pr perhaps not, they are slow growers. Mm. And people also often ask, do, is, it ne is it necessary to, to divide them? I say no, clovias like uh, grow crowded and then they flower at their best. But you can divide them and you can take, it's going to take a long time for them to recover again. Yeah. Unlike acropanthus, which is quick growing, yeah. you, are, you get quick results again. Yeah. Okay. Um, somebody's asking, we have about 30 olive trees in the Southern Cape. In summer, it gets attacked by olive lace bug. We feed the trees with all necessary organic feeds, mulch, and our own compost. Are there any companions to plant to deter these bugs? Hmm. I've seen these attack our trees too. And we've got lots of things growing around our exactly, trees. Exactly, because we've got the wild olives and we've got a lot of bugs on them. Yeah. So I don't think there's anything specific. Um, but. It's again, the more diversity, the more exactly. insects you get in and the more birds you get in, the more you get some balance. Because 30 trees are quite a lot. I mean, this is like and, a and, uh, mini orchard. And a healthy orchard. plant can always, uh, it's always better to, uh, to ward off diseases. And if, if one gets the right feeding for them as well, and, and really they are very healthy, you'll find far less problems. But what one can do as well is plant, for instance, something aromatic around yeah. your, and I think it's something like a lavender tree. Yeah. It repixes not our lenses. As we do around our vegetable gardens, yes. it won't work 100%, but at least it will keep many bugs away because it confuses their scent. Exactly. And, and this lavender tree, it repixes not our lenses, indigenous, yeah. quick growing little tree, and yeah. it's a lovely little tree. And yeah. I think it will, it will definitely help as well, as well as being a, a sum of, uh, of a windbreak as well. Yes. But I think... So I think also when I see, I don't know how old these trees are, so they'll also yeah. be, depending on how teenage like they are, they'll be attracting. Um, but when I look at the old olive orchards in my environment, where people have left the weeds yeah. and there's a multiple of plants around, I don't see as much disease problems. or problems as other places. Yeah, it's true. Okay, somebody's asked about vegetables. If I start my own kitchen garden at home, what are some of the best plants to start with? And I think you had the answer there also about having a kind of boundary. Um, if it's only a small space, people tend to have walls on the side. So you think, what can you grow up the walls? What will create shelter? Where is your, your main light coming from? So that you, you bring in enough light, but also shade it when it's difficult things. I mean, I think the grenadillas are amazing to just give some kind of screening in summertime when there's too much intense sun and it grows so fast. Um, but soil, like we said, you know, just to really improve your soil, and know which bits of your soils are tricky, like if you have bits of soil that retains too much moisture and it becomes a bit wet that you plant things can then cope with that. And also rotate your crops now uh, to... Definitely, bit, yeah. yes. So you always have your... Same with what we've done with the mustard and with what our um, legumes plants that really improve the soil immensely. Um, beans <laughs> and then move on to your hungry plants now in summertime it's really wonderful to add your aubergine your tomatoes all those really needy plants that also take quite a longer period to mature and then you'll be harvesting from them until winter comes really um, and then after that comes the in betweeners like your spinach beetroot and then right at the end you want to finish off with your carrots and your spring onions and leeks that really don't need much rich soil, so 
allowing that to continue to rotate. And if your space is really small, I like just muddling a lot of things together. I think it's good to know that fennel doesn't like many other plants, or many other plants don't like fennel that much. <laughs> I love fennel. <laughs> but um, other than that, yeah, some companion plants always helps too. I think that's nice to know. Great. Please explain how to grow asparagus. <laughs> so they, they're easy to grow from seed, but you have to be patient. I think you have to wait about three, five years um, to get a decent crop. Um, whereas if you know somebody has some asparagus, you can get some small plants, you can really start harvesting within two years. Um, we have done both, but um, it's important to allow for the first few years to allow for growth, to allow for the leaves and not to harvest too much. And then now as we've got our crop going, it's really this time when you come and you see every shoot popping up, you just come and dig it in. Um, to eat, and they're great fresh. I, I'm sure you've been munching them fresh too. Huh? They've got that almost hazelnut-like mm. yeah. taste. Yeah, it's, it's a special thing. Yeah. Um, so, I think once you have asparagus actually in and that's mature, three month, years old or so, then you can really just give it hardly any attention. It just keeps on coming back and dropping down. So, in winter you'd clean it up again and wait again for the new growth to to pop up again. Good. And always leave enough leaves to invest because the plant sits sun panels to, to invest new. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I don't think anybody's that fast to harvest yeah. everything. Yeah. There's normally a few <laughs> strands that take That's away. It. And I quite like it when they start mm. yeah. kind of yellowing that mm. autumn color too. It's nice. Okay, I don't see any more questions coming, so if you want us to send any questions that we can answer, we are here for you. <laughs> um, can I top the tea so long? Thank you. Bernada. Good. Okay. So this is also Rose Month up ahead. <laughs> um, that's why we've got the rosy theme here. And this tea we're actually selling online. We decided, again, this idea of bringing bubble and stone to your home, that from next month on you can buy a bundle of fresh green rose pelagonium leaves with some roselle, and you can make your own tea like this Fantastic. at home, which is great. Wonderful. It's my favorite tea. <laughs> it's lovely. I can see why. It's really nice, Re refreshing. Mm. and. You can just make it in your backyard and having it. Yeah. Wow, it's, it's fantastic. Things don't have to be complicated. Mm. And it's just, yeah, it's not, it's not yeah, it's quite simple to make. And it's, yeah. It's so cheerful. It's wonderful. Absolutely. So with rose months, oh, heavens, that's when the bugs come in. Ah, something about bugs. Okay. <laughs> Natural insect repellent that you can use to keep insects away from your veggie garden. Now, I've got a special recipe that's really just chilies and garlic and I add a few other things it's actually on Candide you can go to natural insecticide and even on there's a YouTube bubble and stirring video that we did a few years ago um, I tend to use this at home and here we have large scales we actually buy in this garlic mix ready-made um, and one dilutes it so with the dilution over here, we'll have the tractor going back and forth and sprinkling it around the garden. At home, I tend to only need it really maybe twice a year in mm. my vegetable garden, um, but it's great on roses mm. too. So I make a little batch, and then I would dilute one part to about eight parts water, but of soap to squeeze with it so it sticks on the plant. And because it's natural, one has to do it more regularly if you see the bugs are pestering, Obviously, I think particularly right. with young mm. gardens. That's um, a little bit more demanding. Yeah, uh, when things come in. Regularly. Yeah, but um, even the very safe garlic and chili mm. is something that bees will have a reaction to. Mm. So I think it's so important for people to realize, even when they use natural pesticides, that one has to take care of the insect. That you have to be observant mm. about when you're going to spray. So you're going to spray at the time when the bees are flying by, but that you're going to do it maybe in the evenings mm. when you know the insects are going to be sleeping and the baddies are coming out <laughs> and you can squash mm. in those snails at the same and, time. And Gondola <laughs> also around your veggies and between them you can also introduce wild garlic for instance and, yes. and rosemary and so many yes. aromatic plants it conf again confuses the insects. Absolutely. And it just it, it will if you look in the Eastern Cape uh, many uh, the Corsa kraals Around mm. them, I've got Brichantus mm. or now Coleus uh, barbatus. Yeah. So it's a very aromatic shrub that's been used, and, and it must help them in the sense that they will have less uh, uh, pests as well. Yeah. So it's been used for uh, for a long, long time already in, in, in rural yeah. Africa as well. And I know people always think about space, but I often see that next to a biggish shrub, you'll have yeah. your vegetables growing so much more strong. Mm. 
Right. There's almost as if they have this desire to have friends companions. and companions. <laughs> You're yeah. right. We underestimate because we, because we can only see the above, yeah. but we don't realise the intermingle of roots and fungi that, and the network of fungi all over the system yes. that connects things to each other. Yes. And, and in fact, nothing is an island on this planet, even our humans. We're all interconnected. We are so dependent yeah. for fruit. It's community. For, exactly. Yeah. And, and they're dependent on us, the plants, and we're dependent on them. Yeah. And, and you're right. Okay. Oh, um, I would like to introduce rocks into my garden. Where do I start? How do I know which rocks to match with which plants? Okay. <laughs> I would say it depends as well. If you live in the Cape Town area, near Table Mountain, for instance, you can use monkey stone. And monkey stone are the typical, or the, the typical sandstone. That it's yeah. minerally deprived, it's very poor, uh, it gives mm. rise to poor soil, but it's very mm. beautiful. Mm. And I would say first uh, create your landscape, in other words, your uh, uh, group of sand or, or, or uh, uh, soil, the frame of soil you bring in, mm. and place your rocks. And you, the way you place your rocks is always, you've got to, uh, bury about half the rock. It must look if the rock raises, gets raises out of the soil if it has been permanent. So the yeah. idea of permanence. Yeah. So that's your, your and also then it is it's quite easy to also to establish if you look if you look at all the succulents around Table Mountain for instance or in this famous area. Mm. It's quite simple. I did a book on waterwise gardening and, I, and, and if you look under the section of the, the famous garden all your succulent plants that you will be able to grow there, uh, I mentioned. There's many, there's for instance aloes, aloe comixta, a typical fainbos aloe, aloe sucotrina, mm. and aloe mitriformis, for instance, mm. aloe brevifolia, small aloes one can put in, but among it, it's always good to, to intermingle it with non succulent plants as well, like blue felicias and other things, because plants don't grow on an island, even the succulents. They will uh, uh, occur among other plants. Yes. So there's many companion plants you can grow with them. But then the mesums. The mesums are also very important because the mesum family is South Africa's largest succulent plant family. Mm -hmm. And the, the, especially the phages. And even you can start with your annuals, like your fecosi, carpanthia, which mm -hmm. you can even use as a vegetable, yeah. just like waterblomikis. You can use your bokpai phages, dorotheanthus, or livingston daisy, uh, mm -hmm. dorotheans belediformis, incredible mm -hmm. plant. Mm -hmm. It provides a show for at least a two months in the, during spring, as we have seen at Babylon's Tour. Mm. So that provides a rapid show. But then you plant your more permanent things, and then you can in, in, introduce your euphorbia, mm. caput medusa, the this, this snakehead yeah. uh, uh, euphorbia, yeah. which is so common on, on lion's rump and many parts of the peninsula, yeah. also Chapman's Peak, close to the coast. And they do sell them at the Botanic Gardens at Kishmo. So many of these little mesums mm. that you can use, like Rusha and Neolata, mm. they are available at the, the nursery there at Kishmo or at Karua uh, Botanical Gardens. Yes. There's a few nurseries which sell them. Even Stark Airs also got a good variety of, of succulent plants. Yeah. So start with your local nurseries, and they usually grow plants which are locally adapted. If, you, if we're up in the north, it, it, is, it is different again. If you're in, in a bushveld area, I would say you make use of your, your bushveld complex uh, uh, rocks, many, many different ones, like dolomites. Mm. And, and you've got so many bushveld succulents that you can grow from big to small. Mm. Bushveld succulents are usually quite big and large. The largest succulent is a biobab. I don't say you have to grow biobab because it will break up your garden. <laughs> but, but it's all these columnar, bigger, like euphorbias and other succulents. And if you're in the Karoo, again, you can use your Karoo dolorites, shales, uh, uh, to create, and you create it the same way. Usually, your dolerite rocks are stashed like little uh, yeah. uh, copies uh, yes. uh, on top of each other and yeah. imitate nature to, yeah. to get that natural feeling. And then you can bring in all your karoo succulents, like for instance, your aloe broomy, named after Robert Broom, mm. uh, uh, and, and many, many other, and aloe grandi dentata, it's a little speckle leaved aloe, beautiful thing, mm. and, and aloe uh, longistyla, very long. And there's a lot of little mesums you can also, mm, like mm. the Iberlanzias, very colorful mesums mm. and, and forming and just create a lovely picture of it. And to think, yeah, and, and a, a, a garden is an ongoing thing. You start off with your pioneers and there's always this change and every year you will renew it and new yes. things will come. Yeah. Slow growing plants will come into flower and they always bring in joy when you see sometimes, first time, yeah. this thing is coming into flower. Yeah. And then the sunbirds come and then you really enjoy the other facets as well of that garden. Yeah. Or little birds coming to collect a little yeah. pieces of your sansevieria to build nests or, or other things. But it, so it, it's it's fascinating. But but rocks, 
So use your local rocks. If you're at, mm. on Malmesbury area and you can use your Malmesbury shales, yes. like Worcester yes. area, there's, there's so many local shale uh, uh, that one can use. It's, yeah. I know it's a, sometimes a little bit difficult to get a hold of the rocks itself. Yeah. But if one starts looking at some nurses, they do sell rocks as well. Yes. But it is not easy to always get a hold of them. Yeah. But, the, but they really uh, bring a different fac uh, yeah, uh, facet to, to a garden, rocks. But I also think and when people have gardens, when they start digging, yeah. you'll find things in the soil. So exactly. You, instead of just taking it to the dump, I mean, use that what you find in the soil. And I, but I also yeah. think what's important is this patience that one has. Mm. That I know with my new area that I've been growing at home, um, it just it takes a few years. Mm. And I think that's the encouragement I want to give to young people or people with new gardens, that it really does take years mm -hmm. to actually get this diversity and this, the health within exactly. a space. Yeah. And the other advantage of, of rocks in the garden, it's you always have moisture settling underneath totally. the rock. Totally, yeah. So it, it provides little niches where plants can adapt. Yes. And even shrubs and trees will get their rocks under the, instead of going under your roof or under yeah. your house, that yeah. you encourage them to go under the rocks. And I think the idea is not necessarily that one has to grow a rockery, but I can see the yeah. minute I've added a rock to a dry area mm. where I'm working, the shelter it provides is exactly. enormous. Mm. Even, even a small rock, even a rock yeah. the size of this, can give so much value to yeah. a new space. Yeah. Okay, I think, what do we have here? We've got two questions. Um, Agapanthus. Mine is in full sun, but it doesn't flower. What should I do? I'm based in Cape Town. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's strange with Agapanthus. They, they usually flower in full sun. Yeah, and I would say, maybe. I, I would say in the case of Agapanthus, mm. I will, they, they're voracious feeders. That's why they go so quick. Yeah. So they probably depleted the, the soil. They can't walk to a compost heap, so you've got to <laughs> bring the compost to them. So yes. what I would suggest is, like you said, split them, replant mm. them and just provide them with good manure in the soil yeah. and plant them and you see a year after that that summertime if it's yeah. agapanthus the the precox which is yes. the, the most commonly grown one yeah. get them either in, in blues or whites in the various yeah. sizes yeah. but they should grow because the, at Christmas they grow they flower almost every year they're so faithful yes but I think there must be it's probably a feeding problem, but, but they need I mean, full sun. Cape Town so, uh, soil is yeah. poor. So our, I our, our Cape Town soil, and you, you've said it, yeah. and it's, it's, so one has to it enrich it to. a lot, because they, those precocks come from the, the summer rainfall intermediate, yes. nice now area uh, uh, of yeah. the east, and, they, and you're right, they need much, much more, more fertile care. soil. So you have to play mom and dad there too, you've I guess. Got to. mm. <laughs> okay, I think this is about the last question. What should you be doing in the garden right now before summer? <laughs> Having garden day and resting, no. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a, I think, yeah, apart from just relaxing and enjoying and celebrating your garden, there's a lot what one can do. And, and, and just with your pruning shears, pick out all the dead wood, neaten up your plants, and uh, uh, there's, there's, you can, and it's also becoming because it's now the spring, mm. and, and uh, you, many, it's also a good time now to start plechantus. And your plechantus plants... The cuttings. Yeah, the cuttings. Yeah. And the pl you can plant them in situ in your garden. So you plant them like almost like you will sow an annual seed, and yes. by autumn it will flower. Yeah. And they love uh, shade. So gardens always start out sunny. And then the, the trees come, and the people can't understand my grass dies. And it's time to grow ground covers. And these plechantus plants are wonderful. You can also plant them... Just like uh, uh, your uh, uh, your blue, uh, uh, you can plant them on this on the eastern and southern side of your garden. Just like hydrangeas, mm. that's what I meant, mm. where they don't get the full sun. Mm. And there's the, the you can either use the ground cover plechantus. Some of them are very exquisitely beautiful, like ambiguous, mm -hmm. and, and and then you can grow your shrubby ones like eclone and fruticosis, and and. You plant the cuttings now, this time of the year, and by autumn you'll, have, you'll reap the flowers. Yeah. Beautiful. And you can either keep them permanently or repeat them or just prune them back again. Yeah. But there's, there's such a lot to, and depending on what type of garden as well you create. So there's yes. so much to do in springtime. But also plant many of your perennials. There's beautiful perennials which one can introduce, like your barberton daisies. But if you're in the Fainbos area, obviously yeah. it's, it's now becoming dry. And one has to be okay. careful, so your fainbos plants, well, I, one will establish them in autumn, but if it's uh, in your summer rainfall areas, it's now the time for planting yeah. trees, shrubs, whatever you, you, you think is yeah. right for that situation. And there are, so, there are lots of literature, and it's so mm. great today, also with Mr. Google, 
to... Or Candide, <laughs> or yes, can, exactly. But, All but, the uh, exactly, Candide, answers. I find is, it's so practical. Useful. Yeah. It's so useful. I put gardeners together and they can, they yeah. can chat. And, and you can ask so many questions on Candide and you'll get a lot of answers yeah. and people will encourage you and help. And don't be scared to make mistakes. But I Even think if you prune wrongly, the yeah. plant grows itself it'll, right It'll again. tell you, exactly. <laughs> it'll, it'll tell but you. I think the idea is yeah. about looking at nature and seeing where are you going to take care of your plant mm. near your mm. house and where you can allow the rain to, to give it to the do. sustenance. Great. So we've had fun. I hope you have. <laughs> Please come and visit Babylon's tour and it's just such a joy to experience. Um, and we are preparing for resting in our gardens on Sunday. Celebrate your gardens. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks.